Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Good morning on this lovely Saturday and welcome to the UJ International Day of Mathematics events. Today's program is made possible by Netex and the NRC as well as the South African Mathematical Society, the South African Math Foundation, and the NRF SASTA. My name is Dr. Serene Rathilal, and I'm a lecturer at the University of Johannesburg's Department of Mathematics and Applied Mathematics. And I am Dr. Lungiles Tolle, and I am the senior, senior lecturer and director of the UJ Soweto Science Center, and we are your hosts for today's event. Um, to kick off today's program, I would like to introduce you to the HOD of our Department of Mathematics and Applied Mathematics. I just want to quickly confirm, has Prof joined us? Not yet. Well, nonetheless, um, as, he, as he joins, I would like to tell you more about him. So our HOD, Professor Enyabatsa, holds a mathematic, uh, sorry, holds a PhD in applied mathematics, which he obtained from the University of Botswana. His, re his research focuses on the application of mathematics to disease evolution and control. His research interests are also emerging infections, vector-borne diseases, and modeling crime dynamics and modeling drug abuse. Professor Nyabatsa is an internationally recognized mathematician and editor of four highly ranked journals in the field of biomathematics and mathematical biology. He has successfully supervised 14 PhD students and 56 PhD students, uh, sorry, MSc students. He is passionate about training future mathematicians. Um, so Prof Inyabatsa, I see you've now joined. We now hand over to you, thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Serene, and um, uh, greetings to, to everybody. And I'm glad I can see faces that I can, I can identify. And um, um, I see Zurab and the, the other guys there. Thank you so much. I, I really appreciate. And um, maybe I should first say uh, thank you to uh, the organizers of this event, in particular, um, uh, Dr. Ratilao and the, the sponsors and all those that are involved in setting up such a thing. Now, the Department of Maths and Applied Maths is actually delighted to um, have you um, guys being part of um, this wonderful initiative as we celebrate the International Day of Mathematics. Um, it is always a pleasure to um, have such kind of an event, linking up with um, colleagues from uh, different parts of uh, the country. Um, I'm not so sure if I, I should say different parts of the world, but I guess this has mainly been um, something that is um, within our borders. And I would want to welcome, and on behalf of the department and on behalf of the faculty, uh, these are events that um, the faculty is always happy to hear about them. And for your own information, I think on the 14th, I got an email from the dean asking us um, or asking me that this is the International Day of Mathematics. What is your department doing? Um, and uh, she was delighted uh, when I told her that we have this particular event and our newly appointed marketer is actually in the loop and she is, um, uh, you know, on it and covering it. So it is actually a pleasure uh, from my side, um, representing the department. I want to welcome you all. And I, I am looking forward to deliberations that will um, ignite our passion in mathematics, that will ignite, you know, give us some energy uh, with regards to this particular subject that we, we so love so much and um, let this time be a time of engagement. Let this time be a time where we will link up with, um, with colleagues, where we will discuss 
um, how good it is to be part and parcel of, um, of this particular program. To the young ones uh, who could be part of this, um, or who are part of this um, uh, grouping, um, let me just say you are very much welcome. The University of Johannesburg um, looks forward to um, you know, welcoming you as you, you know, venture into a subject such as such as mathematics. It is actually, um, I feel delighted. I'm seeing we have 220 participants at the present moment, and I'm looking forward to uh, having um, them coming more and more and um, such kind of an event. Um, I know I will have a discussion with the team that is organizing that this event be actually an, an, you know, a huge annual event that can extend further even beyond our borders. And I'm actually so delighted to welcome you guys. I see the numbers are actually increasing of our participants. Um, welcome, thank you so much. I am delighted to, um, to, to, to actually be representing a department with energetic individuals that, um, uh, you know, that are so energized to uh, propel or propagate uh, the subject of mathematics, uh, especially in this country and in this province. So thank you so much, everybody. And I, I wish you um, a wonderful engagement as you do your quizzes, a wonderful engagement as some of you win prizes, a wonderful engagement as, you know, as we continue to share. I know Professor Mumuniat has got a wonderful presentation that is prepared for us. And uh, from my side, on behalf of the department, thank you so much, everybody. And I wish you, um, you know, a blessed event. And um, well, I will certainly see you on the side of uh, the closing ceremony. Thank you so much. And I wish you all the best. Back to you, Sarin. Thank you, Prof uh, Nyabata. Thank you so much for the, well, well, for the warm uh, welcome. Uh, I would like to now introduce um, our next speaker who will also be giving us a nice message and a welcome, uh, Professor Christine Jordan. Professor Kirsten, sorry. Professor Kirsten Jordan started her career in 1991 as a mathematics teacher at Pretoria High School for Girls. Uh, professor Jordan is a full professor in mathematics at the Department of Decision Sciences, which is at the University of South Africa. She is also um, part-time executive director of the South African Mathematics Foundation. Professor Jordan served as the president of the South African Mathematical Society from 2016 to 2019. She also holds a Royal Society Newton Advanced Fellowship for her research in special functions and orthogonal polynomials. Professor Jordan is also one of only three women in South Africa to be evaluated by the National Research Foundation as a mathematics researcher, and she has considerable international recognition. Professor Jordan, I don't wanna to say too much more, but please, I welcome you. The stage is all yours. Thank you very much, Ndili, for that introduction. So um, welcome to everybody from uh, the South African Mathematics Foundation. Um, I want to share just some ideas with you. Uh, and I'm going to take you back to, to something that I was involved in when I was at school. Um, I'm not sure whether they still do this nowadays, but when I was at school many, many years ago, we went on week-long camps that were known as felt schools. I think if I remember correctly, I went once in grade six and again in grade 11, possibly more, but I particularly remember the one in grade 11. Um, so we did many interesting things, but um, the grade 11 one, we were somewhere in the bush sleeping in dorms and on the one day, we had to do a sort of wilderness trail obstacle course in smaller groups. So there was rivers and trees and all kinds of puzzles that we had to solve. The obstacles were really interesting. And some actually posed quite difficult problems. And we had to solve these to be able to proceed. I wish I could remember all of them exactly. But um, one of them, I remember something like, uh, finding a way to cross a river, there was no other way to cross it, but, and all we were given was two or three poles and a rope. Um, and then we had to 
solve this practical problem about how we're going to use those tools to now cross the river. I really enjoyed this challenge and actually found that I was quite good at solving these kind of practical problems. I think I helped my group solve quite a number of them. So you may be wondering why I'm talking about this, talking about cloud schools and what it all has to do with mathematics. Um, well, at the time, as I said before, I was in grade 11 and I was achieving quite reasonable marks in all of my subjects, but I actually had no idea that I had a special talent in mathematics or in problem solving. It was only many, many years later that I realized this and I learned to develop these skills. So a significant number of skills that are needed today to thrive in the job market. Um, in our present era that they refer to as the fourth industrial revolution, um, they are linked to problem solving. And mathematics, uh, by teaching you mathematical reasoning, um, logical reasoning, cognitive flexibility, and computational literacy, is really the ideal vehicle to develop your ability to think out of the box. In other words, to find strategies that have not been shown to you before that solve a particular problem. So when I talk about this kind of mathematics, I'm not talking about what you learn in the classroom, like, for example, if you're in grade 11, I think, learning to complete the square, uh, or the, the type of technique that you can mostly master by knowing what procedure or algorithm or rule the teacher told you to apply, and then you just follow that. No, I'm talking about different kinds of skills. I'm talking about developing the thinking skills that you need to solve non-standard problems, something that you haven't been shown before. So how do you learn these kinds of skills? Well, an effective way of being exposed to problem solving is through participation in mathematics competitions. These competitions include questions that you would have not generally seen before and for which standard talk procedures will not be sufficient to solve the problems. There's an official national event that you may have heard of, namely the South African Mathematics Olympiad, which is organized by the South African Maths Foundation. And many people think that these competitions are just for the boffins, but it's not true. So there's very many different levels at which you can participate and be exposed to the kind of problems in this competition. Um, the first round for this year has already been written. So if you are interested in participating in the future, or you would like to improve your problem solving skills for next year's competition, um, we have an app, the Maths Foundation. It's, I'm just going to share my screens quickly so that you can see what I'm talking about. Um, all right, uh, this app, is called mytutor.chat. So it's what's in the bottom left corner there. And apart from this app, which you can download on your phone and you have exposure to over a thousand type of problems that teach you exactly these kind of problem solving skills that are not really linked to your school curriculum. Uh, we also have a mathematics talent search, the same talent search that makes use of the app. So, for this year, you can still join the talent search now, even though it already started in November, you'll see it continues until May. Um, or you can simply just choose to download the app and use the app to start um, uh, practicing your problem solving skills. The app adapts to your own skills. So as you solve problems, it either if you're struggling, it gives you easier problems, or if you're managing the problem that it gives you quite easily, it gives you harder problems. Um, One minute, Prof. Thanks. So you can use this to practice and develop your own talents. And um, in any case, they fund problems and it gives you exposures to this kind of thing that goes beyond the curriculum and is exciting and interesting and teaches you the kind of skills to actually do well in our competitions. If you do well in the talent search, you could very well be selected for our training programs that are all free. Um, so I would encourage you to have a look at this. If you want to know about the SAMF talent search, you can just simply Google SAMF talent search, those words in the blue heading. I um, thank you for listening, and I hope that you all will participate in our competitions in the future, and I trust that you will enjoy this day as well.
Thank you very much, Mugile Amdan. Thank you, Prof. Thank you so much. Um, I would like to now introduce our next speaker. Uh, before I do so, um, just some information about where to type in your questions. So we have a Q&A uh, box. We also have a chat box, which everybody has already been using. Thank you. It's exciting to see what you guys are writing in there. But for questions, please do type in the Q&A. Right, so our next speaker is Professor Ibrahim Momonyet. So Prof. Ibrahim is a professor in the Department of Mathematics and Applied Mathematics at the University of Johannesburg. His main area of research are mathematical modeling, fluid dy dynamics, and computational mathematics. Professor Ibrahim, on to you. Thank you, um, Ungile. Um, good morning, everyone. I'm just sharing my screen. Uh, so welcome to um, my talk. Uh, it's on the role of mathematics and applied mathematics in 4IR. Um, I just want to quickly have a look on the left in case you don't know why these organizations would actually be involved. So today is the International Day of Mathematics, uh, the University of Johannesburg. And if you look there, there's an organization called NISEX. Uh, NISEX is the National Institute for Theoretical Physics, and then it's computational or computer sciences or has been added to that. Um, the NRF, uh, that's the National Research Foundation of South Africa. When you get to university, especially at the higher levels of study, so honors, master's, PhD, uh, you would normally apply to the NRF for funding. Uh, here you would apply with um, a proposal, you would say what you want to do. Your proposal would be essentially evaluated by peers in the field and uh, depending on how successful your proposal is and if it's supported you'll get money to pay for your studies so when you get to anything in mathematical sciences physics chemistry at the higher levels of study so it's beyond your degree you'll find that there's a lot of funding available for you especially if you are a good student so you've performed well over the years and um, you have the support of your head of department, your lecturer, your supervisor. The South African Mathematics Society, um, you've heard that Prof. Kirsten Jordan was the president of SAMS. Um, Shireen, who is uh, a co-presenter, is also on the SAMS Council. So SAMS essentially is responsible for looking after mathematicians at a very high level. Um, we usually send our master's, PhD students to participate in the South African Math Society conferences. And um, it's a very supportive organization. So when you become a mathematician, those of you who are thinking of it, you actually join a big family. It's a very diverse family. Um, like all families, we have our ups and downs. Um, but it is a family that's there to support you. Um, the South African Math, Math Foundation, Prof. Jordan spoke about what they do. Uh, in particular, the maths competitions. And then the Northcliffe Rotary Club. Now, Rotary, if you don't know, um, there's a lot of outreach work, um, assistance in communities in need, etc. So if you look at just the labels on the left, it gives you an indication of the breadth, I would say, and depth of support you can receive if you are interested in mathematics, if you want to take mathematics further, if you want to use mathematics to make a contribution um, to society. Now, my talk speaks about the fourth industrial revolution and what is the fourth industrial revolution. And what I thought of doing was maybe just showing you that our interaction with the environment is usually what leads to innovation. Okay, so you can't speak about 4IR without speaking about innovation. So if you look at this picture on the top here, you'll see this is an Egyptian trying to get water from the Nile. Um, one of the first le uh, lever and pulley systems was developed by the Egyptians. And the reason they, they needed this was to get water from the Nile, lift it up, pour it onto their fields. The next big innovation would be uh, trains with steam engines. The reason we needed trains was um, as society spread, in many countries, you move from city to city, you needed a way of transporting goods, uh, you needed a way of transporting people that was cost effective, it was cheap, um, and it was, I would say, reliable, right? So the things that we're looking for, 
especially when you're trying to do innovation. Think of reliability, right? You need to know when a train's gonna arrive at a station, when is it gonna leave? You need to know, for example, that if you do build this device, what is the depth of the water or how low will the Nile uh, River go and how high will it go? Now, the Nile River is well known for flooding. So essentially, when it's flooding season, you wouldn't need this lever. You would generally need it maybe before or after flooding. And then if it drops further, well, your lever won't work. So it's all about thinking about how you interact with your environment and, and use technology to take um, advantage of your environment. Now, first, industrial revolution, water and steam. Second, electric power. Um, and then the third is the digital revolution. Fourth, industrial revolution is what we'll talk about. Now, these are just labels, right? So don't get hung up on a label. Um, rather look at the opportunities presented um, by, in fact, being alive at this time. So, in fact, one of the definitions that I found, uh, which I thought is very appropriate, is that 4IR is technology, refers to technology, AI, robotics, cloud computing, drones, Internet of Things. So, again, it's essentially how we as people interact with um, technology, right? Robots doing work, you have many devices. You may be aware of some, you may not be aware that some of these devices are actually communicating with a cloud of information, collecting information. Um, your cell phone uh, collects information about you all the time, how many steps you take, right? Uh, for your cell phone to tell you how many steps you've taken, um, it needs to record lots of other information to be able to get to the number of steps. Right, so um, it's got a compass, it's got um, a gyroscope, which tells you which direction the phone is facing. Um, and so to build up these technologies requires a lot of basic knowledge, I guess you could say. And a lot of that is driven by mathematics, right? So to get a gyroscope to speak to a compass, to speak to um, a GPS, right? A lot of that communication that happens um, is based on mathematics. Um, most cars these days have got a tracker um, that essentially monitors your speed, um, distance, your, your trips, etc. So you, your tracker can actually be used to tell you, look, you, know, you drive too fast, you drive too slow. Okay, it never complains about driving too slow. Um, if you want to know where your children have been, if they've used your car, well, the tracker will tell you. Okay? Um, factories in terms of outputs monitored or continuously. Uh, smart watches, um, most of you have seen the Apple watch, there's a Huawei watch, a Xiaomi watch, right? These watches record many things about your health, your heart, oxygen supply, etc. And all of this needs mathematics as a basis because essentially it's taking digital, converting it into a signal. That signal has to go into an algorithm. The algorithm has to then speak back to the watch or to the phone to say, okay, all this information I've collected means that this person is having a heart attack, right? Maybe, maybe not. But essentially that's where this is headed. You can monitor your plants, um, anything in the uh, environment, farms, etc. Farms these days, farmers use drones to fly over their crops to make sure everything's okay. They use sensors in the ground to tell them whether or not um, there's enough water in the ground. Um, so all of this is happening continuously, right? So lots of information is being generated here, okay? Now, why mathematics? So Prof. Jordan hinted at this where she said that maths helps you to solve problems. It helps you to quantify, interpret data, um, comprehension of text, you know, those word problems that all of you probably don't like. That's very important um, because what it does, it teaches you to take language and convert it into mathematics. Debating, right? How do you argue uh, from a factual perspective about something? Project management, personal finance, and the importance of mathematics, statistics, all of the mathematical sciences is, as I've said earlier, in terms of sustainability and environmental conservation. So it's how we interact with the environment. 
or how can we better interact with the environment? So electric cars, self-driving cars, etc. All of that depends on mathematics. And this is another comment um, made by Prof. Werner Olifir from the uh, Governing Beckham Mathematics Development Center. It's that mathematics helps you to solve real life problems. And this is needed for job creation, sustainable economic growth, etc. The I almost want to say the days are where you as young people actually go out to a company to get a job um, are probably diminishing and it's more important now that you look at innovation, innovating yourself, finding a problem in your community that you can solve and then finding a way of turning that into a business. And so that's the step uh, into innovation. Um, another comment is that what many learners and parents fail to realize is maths and science are enabling subjects. Right? So if you do math and science and you do well at them, they actually open doors for you. If you think of problems that maybe your parents had to face versus things that you have to face, now these are problems uh, at work, not necessarily other kinds of problems. Um, we have this complex environment that we live in where to go from A to B requires you to know something about where you are, the space, the path that you need to take, etc. Um, a lot of this has to do with a subject called topology, um, which is pure maths. A lot of it is computing, which is an applied maths. So, so these subjects speak to each other. Um, in economics, you had supply, demand, and then suddenly you have the impact of a rumor, right? How powerful is this rumor? We heard that Russia is going to invade Ukraine. Okay, what does that mean for supply and demand? Whoops, we have a shortage of supply which means the demand's gonna go up, which means petrol, food, bread, all those costs go up. Right? So to model this, you actually do need mathematics, okay? AI in particular, the World Economic Forum, they meet once a year in Davos. Um, the importance of AI computing has become a much bigger issue than it was before. Um, by 2022, 75 million jobs will have disappeared and replaced by 133 million new jobs. These new jobs are all based in AI, machine learning, computing, problem solving, um, environmental sciences, all of that. These are the new jobs. So by freeing up um, workers, it creates the space for us to work on other things. So if you think about us having time to look at global warming, for example, uh, you need time to sort your garbage. You need time to really look at how you're living. Um, look at the number of plastic bags you use, for example, right? Are you living the best way possible? That's a benefit to the environment. If you're working 18 hours a day, you don't actually have time to think about that. But if you can carve out time for yourself, your family, um, you can actually address those issues at a local level, at your home, at your school. Um, and then it becomes um, an advantage to you that you don't necessarily have to work 18 hours. Um, and in fact, in some countries in Europe, they don't work five days a week, they work four days a week. And the productivity hasn't decreased, it's actually gone up. So that just shows that time is not necessarily the variable you need to use to model um, how successful you are at work or in business. It's how well you use that time that is becoming more and more important. And um, the interdisciplinary lens. So the other thing Prof. Jordan spoke about was the fact that you'll be in teams, right? So mathematicians need to work in teams because you will give the maths or the statistics. You'll be working with the social scientists, the psychologists. Um, they'll advise you on how to do things so that people are more acceptable of them. The first computers, looked like machines that were probably gonna kill you, right? So people didn't wanna use them. But when you got consultants in, psychologists, etc., you started getting this thing with the screen, it looked like a TV, people were more acceptable of it. And so now we all have computers, right? So it takes time, uh, usually for an innovation to move um, into an environment. And then the last- One minute, Prof. About, thank you. The last thing to speak about is um, artificial intelligence and evolution. Now, it's not evolution in this sense. It's evolution in how computers are actually helping us to live better lives. 
And all of that is underpinned by mathematics and a field of mathematics called optimization. And if you are good at mathematics, right, especially at school, the ideas here are easy to grasp. The math is not easy, but the idea of what you're trying to do is much easier to get a hold of and for you to then start thinking about how to use those ideas, especially in your environment, at your school, at your university one day, um, in your own home one day, right? How do you use these technologies to help you to evolve, to become a better person, a better citizen, a um, better contributor to society, right? And all of this is underpinned by a knowledge of mathematics that essentially drives this problem solving that we need to be able to do all of this. Um, that's my brief talk, just to highlight a few areas um, and uh, just to say to you, um, that's it. So thank you very much. If there's any questions, I'm not sure if we have time for questions, but I'm happy to take them. Thank you, Prof. We will take one question. Um, so the question is for the funding that you yes. mentioned. Uh, is the funding for, is it only for undergraduate or rather university students? So, or does it also include high school learners? So the funding is for university learners from what's called postgraduate. So it's after graduating. Um, that's from the National Research Foundation. Uh, funding in undergraduate, um, there's various funding organizations you apply to. Um, if your parents or guardians are earning below a certain threshold, you can apply to the government for funding for your undergraduate studies. Uh, when it gets to high school, there you generally have to look to companies, uh, ESCOM, Telcom. Some companies do fund um, students in high school, but it just depends. Normally, the funding would kick in at university. Um, so if you're going to do engineering, engineering's got a lot of mathematics in it. Uh, you would need to look at ESCOM, Telcom, et cetera. If you want to do a BSc, you look at the computing companies, if uh, that's what you're interested in. If you want to do chemistry, physics, there are companies in those areas who, who can provide funding for you. Um, any university that you apply to will have a funding office or a scholarships office, and they'll be able to help you. Um, essentially, they'll give you a list of companies to apply to, or they'll even help uh, to apply on your behalf. Yeah. Thank you, Prof. Thank you so much for that intriguing um, talk. I think I like how you also mentioned that mathematics, you know, you need finance also requires mathematics. I think yeah. learners need to understand that to be an accountant, you kind of have to practice yeah, exactly. your maths and have solid yeah. math skills. Thank you so yeah, much, thanks. Prof. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sorry, Prof. Um, I would like to now introduce um, our next He's not a speaker, but he's going to help us play a little game. So um, this is your time to now show off your math skills and also stand the chance to win really cool um, prizes. So with us to play this uh, quiz is Dr. Andrew Craig. So Dr. Andrew Craig is also um, a lecturer in the, at the university. So he's from Makanda in the Eastern Cape. He studied mathematics and chemistry at Rhodes University. He then went over to Oxford University in the United Kingdom where he completed his PhD in mathematics. Um, after, returning from, after returning from Oxford, he has since been working at the University of Johannesburg and his research interest is in lattice theory, which is a branch of pure mathematics that also can be applied to theoretical computer science. Dr. Craig, Shall we play the quiz? Rather, shall we take the quiz? Yeah, let's uh, let's get going. I just need uh, Prof Mamania to unshare his screen, and then we can get started. Can someone? Um, yeah, perfect. Thank you. Okay, so this is um, this is just a bit of fun, uh, nothing too serious. Uh, I think the questions are all uh, they should all be doable, um, and we we hope that you will in, enjoy it. And there are prizes up for grabs, so um, you obviously want to do as well as possible. Just here on the instructions, you'll see we just in the next step you're going to be asked to enter your name. Please enter your uh, your grade first, followed followed by your name, so that we know. Uh, who is winning prizes in which category. Um, that'll be very useful for us. Um, and with all the questions, the faster you put in your answer, the more points you get. So you want to be quick. 
but you don't want to rush and get it wrong. So that's, uh, that's what we are aiming for is to see if you can get things right, but also get them, get them right fast. So you need to go to ahaslides.com uh, forward slash UJIDM1, because this is quiz one, and then we will have quiz two uh, in a little bit. I'm seeing the numbers ticking up, so I'm just gonna uh, wait a second before we start. It's good, we've got 100 and 174 people ready to, ready to go. Um, so if you can come first out of 174, that will be pretty impressive. Okay, we're up to 180. Um, I'll just give it another minute or two. Um, and then when you're doing the quiz, you can just focus on your phone. All the questions will be there. Some of them are multiple choice questions and some of them you need to enter an answer. Um, just gonna give it uh, a little bit longer. I see people are still signing in um, and Okay, uh, yeah, 220 so, so people still joining. So we'll just, we'll just wait uh, another, another few seconds. Um, and I should mention that there are actually spot prizes up for grabs as well. So even if you don't come first in your category, just by, just by playing the game, you are still eligible for a, um, for a prize. Okay, I'm gonna move on to the next screen and you will then be required to enter your name and then we will get started with this first little quiz. Okay, please, please remember to put your, uh, yeah, put your grade before your, your name. To help us uh, to help us track you afterwards, you can see everyone's uh, joining in here. Okay, this is brilliant. Lovely to see so many participants. Okay, so just please remember uh, put your um, put your grade followed by your um, followed by your name. If you're an, a student, then you want. Um, you want to use 13 um, for, your, uh, for your grade. If you're an undergraduate or postgraduate student, otherwise you just put um, whatever your grade is. I see we've got a grade six competing here. That's brilliant. Come um, hello, that's great. Okay, I think uh, looks like we've got, um, still seeing a few people joining. Sorry for the wait, but it's uh, the most important thing here is to get get as many people participating as possible and uh, to, to go up against one another. Okay, so as I said, the quicker you answer the questions, um, the, the more points you're gonna score. And, um, and obviously you need to get the question right to get any, any points at all. Okay, um, I think we are going to get started now. Um, here we go. So you can just look at your phone, you'll see the questions there. And um, Okay, time is almost up for this first question. Okay, brilliant. So that foxed a couple of you. Um, the correct answer there was number E, that pi remains unaffected because pi is a constant. Okay, next up.
Okay, clock is ticking. Have you have you found the prime number? We'll see in a moment who gets it. Okay. Quite a few there. 33 people getting it correct. Well done. Uh, on to the next one. You might uh, need a pen and paper handy, um, but otherwise you should be able to just reason from what you see on the screen. Here we go. So, and I'm gonna quickly read the question for some of those who are struggling to read it. Um, there is a coin hidden in one of the boxes. The labels provide clues. Two of the labels are false and one is true. Which box has the coin inside? A, the coin is not in here. B, the coin is in A. C, the coin is not in here. Okay, time is almost up here. Okay, it's the correct answer was C there. Um, moving on to the next question. So this is question four of five. How many positive factors does 72 have? Okay, have you got all of those factors? Make sure that you haven't missed any. A few seconds remaining. Okay, and well done. So there are 12 factors of 72. Um, and now on to the last question. Okay, last question. Consider three consecutive natural numbers. Which one of the following statement is not always true? A, at least one number is even. B, at least one number is odd. C, exactly one number is div divisible by three. D, one number is divisible by six. And E, the product is divisible by six. So which one of these is not always true? Okay, so the correct answer there was uh, was number D, and now we can see who. Uh, was the, the final winner Okay, so. Sh Shiva Singh is the overall winner, but don't forget that there are winners in each category uh, for the grade eight and nine and then also for the grade 10 to 12 and there are some spot prizes, so we will. Um, be announcing those winners at the end, but well done to, to Shriva Singh uh, for uh, winning overall there. Thanks very much for playing. There'll be another quiz later in the program. Thank you, Dr. Craig. Well done, Shiva. Uh, well done to all of you who also tried. There is another game, uh, so get ready for that. Next up is our next speaker, who is Mr. Faisal Muhammad. Uh, Mr. Faisal Mohammed has been with Statistics South Africa for over 15 years. He comes from a background of dealing with large amounts of data and has been communicating statistical outputs since he started working for statistical, Statistics South Africa. He trained as a marketer with a BCom honors and supplemented with a master's degree in urban and regional planning development, both from, the, from Stellenbosch University.
Mr. Mohammed has a responsibility for positioning Statistics South Africa to increase the use of statistics and promote a statistically literate society. Mr. Mohammed, over to you. Thank you very much, Dr. Sutton. It's, it's a pleasure to be here and I really look forward to uh, welcoming you and, and giving you a bit of background on, on maths and stats and how they all join together. And I promise you, there'll be no statistical questions. Those mathematical questions got me thinking, but there'll be no statistical questions in this, although math is a really good foundation for that as well. So uh, as, as, we, as we talk, let's just quickly get into what status A is and what we do. We go out and collect information. We go out usually with surveys and censuses. Somebody in green, like I'm wearing today, would come and knock on your door and say, hey, can you please answer these questions? We need it for uh, understanding the development of our country. We need it for understanding what's happening, future planning, decision-making, all those type of things. And that's where Status A plays in, that type of role. And statistics has a really good and close association with mathematics. So we need mathematical students we need maths to be coming out, doing maths, getting a lot more mathematics. And I'm gonna tell you why as well it's important, not only for us as a statistical organization, but also for us as a country. So now, as I mentioned, people are walking out in green and going collecting information. We're currently running the census where we're looking at everybody's detail and we're asking them a whole range of questions uh, about their household. And in the past, we did this with pen and paper. And uh, we, we went out, we asked your questions, a lot of information went that way with paper, a lot of information was scanned and now we go digital. It's a step in the direction of the fourth industrial revolution. It's a step in the direction of saying, we don't need to do a lot of things to get that same information. But then COVID hit and COVID said, well, you know, you need to think even more than just replacing paper with digital tools such as tablets and so forth. And one of those things that we looked at was saying, how do we then use statistics and, and bring in that, that information? And, and now virtually everyone that's, uh, that's participating in the talk has one of those tools, their cell phone. We can now track uh, and, and look at tracking people for migration using cell phones. We can look at every time you go and uh, uh, purchase something and you hear that beep beep of the scanner. We look at that and say, well, let's look at changes in pricing instead of asking somebody to go out and measure the pricing um, uh, and so forth. We can look at satellite images to see where new urban areas are spreading and where they're not. Um, Professor Momiat uh, actually mentioned things where we're talking about how all this plays out. He mentioned real world applications and there it is. Real world applications of taking mathematics extending those problem solving uh, capabilities as Prof Kirsten was talking about, extending those problem solving uh, capabilities into all these new areas. And obviously uh, we want more and more people to join and, and uh, do mathematics so that you can get into those worlds and possibly become a statistician. You heard I'm a, I'm a, uh, I come from a marketing background, but it's not too far and too difficult to say, how do we apply all those skills that we learn in mathematics to an organization like Statistics South Africa, for example. So when, uh, let, let me take a step back. Let me go a little bit backwards and, and talk a bit about mathematics and our organization. And so in 2009, we ran a study uh, or a survey, thousands of kids, uh, over 700,000 uh, learners to go out there and say, what, what, is your favorite, what is your favorite subject? This was part of our census uh, in 2011. Uh, and obviously we're running the latest one now, but we went out there and asked thousands of kids, what is your favorite subject? What do you like the most? And surprise, surprise, or should it be if you actually hear, mathematics was their favorite from grade three to seven. Favorite subject, hands down, no competition. And then something happens in high school, all of a sudden, uh, languages takes over, maths drops quite dramatically, and you see the other subjects going on there. So the question is, kids come in with a love of maths. They come in, it's built in, it's there. I want to work with numbers. I see the world in, in numbers. And they play with those numbers. It's fun. And when you get to the high school, things get harder, but it shouldn't stop. If you are good at sport and you get really good at sport, you don't lose the love for sport. It gets harder, more competition, but what goes on? 
It's not a question that's easy to answer. And there's a variety of factors that lead to that. But if you hear, you're one of those that are possibly, I loved it in, in, uh, great, in primary school. I'm still thinking about it now and I'm doing it further. And we're there to encourage you and say, yes, those are good decisions to make and we'll tell you why. But Stats SA also is one of those organizations that realize, no, 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 we need more mathematical people coming through the ranks. We need more mathematical students going from the early grades all the way to postgraduate because we need them as statisticians. We need them as official statisticians. We need those problem solving skills to kind of work within our organization. So we went out there and did things in schools, fun things like uh, we went soccer for stats and we teach kids about geometry and mathematics. We first go out into the play area. We do things, they'll see the triangles, they'll see the geometry. We go back to the classroom and say, okay, let's take that in. What, what mathematics did you do out there? Did you ever think about it when you're playing soccer? They ah, there's a lot of maths going on here. And we show them and then kids aren't like, ah, you know, no, maths is not for me. I'm playing, I'm having fun. Maybe maths. We went to the teachers and told teachers, listen, mathematics, statistics, there's a lot of in it there. And we know in South Africa, we have a history and a situation where not that many kids are, are taking maths all the way. And so what do we do? We go out there and say, let's help the teachers. Let's help the students. Let's make sure that we can create a population that is enthusiastic about statistics. So then when we go out as an organization and tell you the GDP is X and so many population, and this is the growth trajectory, we have a nation that understands those numbers and a nation that can use those numbers for their own businesses, for their own lives, to make their own decisions, better decisions. But I mentioned the history, going all the back, way back to 1953. This is the legacy we have to deal with. And when we had Hendrik Verbund, what is the use of teaching a Bantu child mathematics when he cannot use it in practice? This is the legacy we deal with today. This is the legacy you are overcoming by being here, by studying math, by telling that legacy. No, 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 you don't write my story. I write a different story. This is the legacy that we want to overcome. But this legacy sits with us today. It sits with us when we look at our figures, our figures for employment. Look at these figures. This chart here quickly tells you how many people are employed, how many are unemployed, and how many are discouraged. So you can see we have 14 million people employed, 14 million, 7.6 million unemployed. Those are people that have looked for work, couldn't find it. I'm looking, I'm looking, I can't find it. We go out there and we ask, are you employed or unemployed? No, I'm unemployed. Okay. Are you looking for work? Yes, I'm actively looking. Then you have close to 4 million people in this country of 60 million on. 4 million people are saying, I want a job, but I'm not looking anymore. There's no skills. The work environment doesn't meet my skills. The work environment is, it's too expensive to look. It costs money to look. And there's simply no jobs available. They are discouraged. So we don't count them in the official unemployment rate. They're in the expanded unemployment rate. We don't count them there. So the official rate stands at 34.9%, almost 35%. And you have another 4 million people who would take up a job if it was there. But they're discouraged. They've lost hope. Don't be one of those who lose hope in the future. Now, a lot of the talk here today has been about the fourth industrial revolution. Look at where the vulnerable is. We have 14 million people and 30% of them are in vulnerable positions, elementary positions, domestic work, elementary. However, it is the parents of many, many of these people who actually will send their kids out and say, no, no, you go further. And we know statistics tells us, our publications tell us that it's easier if your parents had, had higher levels of education for you to get higher levels of education. If they had tertiary, you chance them at tertiary. But our country isn't like that. Our country has a situation where many, many parents never got a chance to go further. You saw that, 1953, you saw. So what happens is you go from elementary and you get into an elementary job. And we want to say, we're looking at the fourth industrial revolution. We're looking at robotics changing things. We need you to make a change to say, don't be in vulnerable uh, positions. Go further, look further, see what can be done. And as a graduate, your chances out the box are so much better. As a mathematics graduate, as any graduate, we look at higher education. 
your chances of being employed in South Africa are much better. Uh, unemployment rate of 12.5% versus the national average of 349 If you don't have metric, it's 40.2. Those numbers tell the story of our country, but it also tells the story of further education. Education pays, education pays, education pays. We can see it in the numbers. We see it in all our numbers that we show. Education pays. And by learning further, you get there. I recall another, another saying by the late Prof uh, uh, Kambule, who said, be like a giraffe. Eat from the top leaves of the tree. There's no competition there. You can be like that. You study further. You study what could be considered hard but it just takes application. What could be considered hard just takes application. Study further, go further, and you will eat where there's no competition. These are the things we're looking at. Our country is changing. You would think uh, places like manufacturing took huge amounts of semi-skilled and unskilled labor. Look at how that's dropping. What's replacing it? Financial services, business services, insurances, modeling. People using their minds to create creativity, and logic to create businesses that actually make a lot of money and that drives the economy. We can see it here. Where's the money? Finance. This is our economy. This is our economy in a little square. And that says, where is the economy headed? Financial services. Manufacturing has declined over time. We are in a service economy. We are doing things virtually, paying virtual services. So that's where things are happening. This is a quick presentation, but want to say that we know that people have come from a history where it's been difficult to do mathematics, where we can see the issues. We know that you can overcome it. And we know that when you overcome it, statistics tells us, the numbers that are reflected in our country tell us, you will achieve, you will get better. Your chances are much better than those who don't take that further step one. That tells us, brings us back now, I'm just going full circle and saying, as people who study mathematics, it's a springboard into statistical careers. But statistical careers also don't have to have the word statistics in them. They could be researchers, data analysts, software engineers, risk analysis, many, many things where it doesn't have the word mathematician, doesn't have the word statistician, but uses the skills of both mathematics and statistics. And so we want to be here and say, utilize those skills you have, go further, make a difference. And, and from that, I wanna say thank you very much. Thank you very much for your presentation, Faisal. It was very enlightening. And I was also quite uh, fascinated to see that the numbers actually show you that uh, furthering your education is actually assisting with decreasing unemployment. Um, so I don't think we have any questions from the, the audience. I will just double check. Do we have any questions from the audience for our speaker, Faisal Mohammed? No. Since, okay, Lungi, you can go ahead. Is there a question? Uh, no, no questions. Then I'd like to thank our speaker, Faisal Mohammed. We truly appreciate you joining our program and presenting and interacting with the students. Thank you very much. I would now like to um, tell you more about our next speaker. Our next speaker is Dr. Mamuletsi Mosia, and she is the Managing Director at the South African Agency for Science and Technology Advancement, NRF SASTA. Mamuletsi earned her BSc Honours Degree and MSc in Chemistry from the University of Natal. She also obtained an MCOM degree in Leadership Studies and her PhD in Chemistry from the Technical University of Aidenhoven. Having recently joined the NRF, she also has experience in working at the CSIR as a senior manager, as well as prior to that, she was a scientist at Cecil, where she grew within the ranks to principal scientist level. I'm quite excited to introduce you to Dr. Mamulet Simosia from the NRF SASTA. Over to you. Uh, thank you for the kind uh, uh, introduction. Uh, I was listening to Faisal and then looking at his presentation. I'm like, yo, this is a setup 
how am I going to match this? Because me, I'm just gonna talk to um, the audience and I don't have all of these brilliant stats that he was presenting. But as I was listening to him, I was reminded of um, almost, what, 20 years ago, 18 years ago, when I completed my PhD and um, as part of um, showing that we are not only into science, but we understand what's happening into the world, we needed to uh, present five um, sayings about just the, the uh, statements that just made uh, sense to you and that made impact into your life. And at the time, I wrote something about what he just presented about Banju education. And I said that the architects of Banju education, um, they wanted us black people to only end up as maids and, um, and, and gardeners. And as a parting shot to that statement, I said, um, I think it was what, um, I think it, and I said, um, uh, today it's, 20, it's 2004, look at me now. And at the time I was graduating with my PhD in a university in Holland. Um, and I think I'm saying this just so that um, any black child who is sitting here today would realize or at least can see that even though the architect of Banju education, and yes, we are still suffering the legacy of Banju education even today, even though the architects of Banju education did not want to see us where we are today, I am glad to see so many Lungi, Lungiles and Azwindinis are sitting here today because then it means that they have reversed that which the Banju education architects wanted to achieve. But I'm digressing. I was just excited to listen to Faisal's presentation. Um, uh, I am from the National Research Foundation. Um, in particular, I'm from the business unit that is responsible for the advancement of science and technology. Now, you cannot have science and technology without mathematics. We cannot advance science and technology without advancing mathematics. And that's the reason why today we are here and we are celebrating the international. I am not going to talk of the statistics because Faisal has already done that. Um, I think for me, it's just to inform you of what we are doing as SASTA. Uh, we, 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 we very much involved in the higher, to, in the education sector in that we provide, we, we run Olympiads um, and we, we part of the organizations and we support the organizations that run Olympiads such as um, the Mets Olympiad, the Science Olympiads, all of these Olympiads that um, are meant to in, in, increase the interest of the STEMI with the learners. We also run, um, or we are pushing for lack of a better word, the after school science clubs. And by doing that, we are not only pushing the love of science, but we are pushing everything science. And as I said earlier, you cannot have science without mathematics. So we want to engage the learners in all the activities that enable them to develop the love for science and to develop the love for mathematics and to be in spaces where they are able to work with each other and assist each other in solving the problems that they find at school. And the most important thing, and that ties up Ed, to what I said earlier, is that we provide uh, role models. So every time we go to schools, we take young people who are the same as the, young, the children that we want to engage with to go and say, I'm from Nkandla, I'm from Vwani, and look at me, I'm now a statistician. Look at me, I'm a geologist. Look at me, I'm a mining engineer. So that these children, even though in their families, they don't see these people or they don't get to see these people, but for, by us in, um, um, exposing them, they are able to see themselves in these people and they're able to dream and say, if she can do it, I can do it too. But we don't only end it there. Once you get to university, we also, um, well, we allow others to help you to get your undergraduate degree. But once you get up there, we then um, at honors level and going upwards, we then um, uh, as NRF now, not only as SASTA, but as NRF, we then pro uh, uh, provide you with the finances to, to um, go further with your studies. As a country, we're not doing very well with uh, regards to the people who have masters and PhDs, especially in the STEM field. And as NRF, we want to actually change that picture and make sure that we have more and more 
black people and females in general who have uh, PhDs in the STEM fields. And basically that's what the NRF is for. And that's what SASTA is for. SASTA, I always tell people that um, without SASTA, NRF will, be, will struggle to find people. So we as SASTA, we make sure that we feed the system with the people in the STEMI fields by making sure that they are interested um, in math and science. And we're trying also to ensure that the drop in, um, in, a, in an uptake of pure maths decreases because now we've seen our high schools, a lot of the children are so afraid of mathematics and they're doing mathematics literacy. It could be because the educators are not uh, um, as skilled in terms of making sure that the learners uh, uh, pass and that's where we also come in in, in educator um, upskilling and just getting them to teach uh, mathematics better. So it's a suit of things that we're doing, but more than anything, we want to make sure that we increase the One number minute. of STEMI graduates yeah. in the country. Um, and I, I'm almost done, thank you so much. So more than anything, the, the aim is for us to increase the number of STEMI graduates in the country um, and to also transform the face of a STEMI employee um, in the country. And um, so both NRF and SASTA, that's all, that's what we are here for. You can find uh, um, uh, more information at uh, www.nrf.ac.za. And thank you for the opportunity and enjoy the day. Happy International Day of Mathematics. Thank you, Dr. Masia, that was really great. Uh, thank you so much uh, for your message from NRF SASTA, that's Dr. Masia. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Wilmarie Morton. So Dr. Wilmarie Morton um, completed her undergrad and honors at uh, UJ, which was at the time called Rand Afrikaans University. Uh, she then moved on and did her MSc and PhD at Wits University in Algebra Logic. So from then on, she started working in the Department of Mathematics and Applied Mathematics at the University of Johannesburg and um, has 15 years experience in tertiary education. Dr. Morton, um, the floor is yours. Thank you very much and thank you for the introduction. Uh, so if I can just confirm that you can see my, or that you see what I've shared. Is it full screen? Can you all see it? Yes, yes, thank you. Right, so I have a slightly different type of talk to the talks that we have had so far. Um, I thought to kind of just look at something every day and just to kind of see what the mathematics behind it is. So something that most of us encounter every day uh, when we go to a shop is something like, a um, well, either called a universal product code or a European article number. And obviously, if we buy books, we've got the ISBNs. Um, and the question is, is there any mathematics in there, right? So obviously, there's some very standard mathematics in the sense that it's a code. So we, we take these numbers that are at the bottom there and we, we encode them into binary. So that's, that's a bit of mathematics. If we look at this, um, just to get the barcode, there's some smart design here. So for instance, these uh, parts that I've highlighted here, those are called the guards. And it's essentially so that when, um, when, you, when your scanner scans this particular barcode, it kind of knows where to, where to start, where the middle of this is and where the end of this is. Um, and then the numbers get encoded in between these guards. And this is done in a very smart way. So if we look at this here at the bottom, you'll see I go 101010, but the left and the right don't look the same. And that's intentional, right? So that um, whatever is between these uh, first two guards, uh, that encoding is different from the encoding between the next two. And that's just so that it's um, so that the scanner can, or the computer rather, can determine where to start with these numbers. But that's, that seems like very far down for the mathematics. So where is the mathematics in, in this? Um, the mathematics that I want to point out today is the check digit. So in an EAN or an ISBN, you typically have uh, 13 numbers. And the last number there is a special digit. And there's some mathematics behind finding that particular digit. So let's see uh, if we can see 
what is the idea here? So the idea is that if um, this code is typed in and an error is made, uh, can, can we kind of pick that up? Or will the computer just kind of accept whatever you type in? Or if you scan and maybe the barcode is slightly damaged, um, is there a way for the computer to pick up that something's wrong? Uh, and that's not really the code that you're wanting to scan, or will it kind of just happily go on? So that's the purpose of this check digit to make sure that once you've entered a number or you scanned in a number, um, you realize that there's a, a, a problem if you find a problem. All right, so what can we do? How can we add one symbol there at the end to, to check? So one thing we could do is we could just add up all the other 12 or nine, however many um, symbols you're using for your particular code, add them all together and divide by 10. So why are we dividing by 10? Because if we divide by 10, then we will have a remainder from zero to nine. So either it's something like 20 and it's divisible by 10, or it's not divisible by 10 and you have a remainder, a remainder of one, two, three, all the way up to nine. And so that's then what we could potentially add as this check digit. Would that be good enough? Let's ask uh, these questions. So maybe just to illustrate first, so suppose this here's the number that we want, then what I mean by that is we literally just add all of these uh, numbers. And so for instance, here we get to 23, and we see that 23 is two times 10. And so then the remainder there is three. And so then we would be tempted then if that was the number that we were trying to uh, add a check digit to, then we'd add the three. Um, so the question is, well, will this always pick up a problem, right? If, if, if I type in the wrong number or let's say something went wrong with that barcode and something looks light and it's supposed to be dark. And so now it enters the wrong number, will it pick it up? Well, yes, if you just have the single digit that's wrong, it certainly would pick up if something was wrong there because, I mean, because we're doing division um, by 10 and we're only using these digits from nine to uh, from zero to nine, yes, it would pick up that. But what if we swap two numbers? So somebody trying to scan the spark code, you can't do it, and the person has to type it in and instead of writing uh, typing in one, two, they type into one, will it pick that up? No, it won't, right? Because whether you're a one plus six or six plus one, it doesn't matter. Addition is commutative, we say, right? So the order in which we do that addition, it doesn't matter. Right, so yeah, we say no. It seems like this is not a good enough option. So what did we do or what was the solution then to this problem instead? The idea was to go and find a weighted sum. So what does weighted sum mean? It means we're still going to add these numbers together, but not as they are. We're going to give a weight to each number. So we're going to multiply it with some integer. And then in that way, you would be able to see if you swapped two numbers, because now the weight for one position is different from the weight for another position. So this was obviously first implemented in the ISBN 10 codes. So there are two examples there of ISBN 10 codes. So let's see how we would go and find the uh, check digit here. So what they decided is they would start with weights from 10 down to one. So an ISBN 10 code has these 10 numbers. And if you go from left to right here, you'll have the weight um, 10 for the first digit, then the weight 9 for the next, 8, all the way down. And then your check digit is actually just got a weighting of 1. But for now, we're just going to look at the part that goes from the 0 to the 2, right? Uh, so now we're just looking at the parts where we have a weight of 10 all the way up to a weight of 2. All right, so what do we do there? Because we want to see, we want to confirm that this 1 should actually be the check digit. So now we're going to take each of these digits and multiply them with the various um, various weights. So like we said, 0 times 10 and 2 times 9. And so we go on up to the point where we get to this weight of 2 for the last or second to last digit 2. Right. Once we've done that, then we add all of this together. Right. So we've got 18, 17, 30. We get to 89. And the goal here is to choose a, tick, uh, a check digit that will make the sum if you were to go and add this last term, so weigh that 
with one so that if you go and take the full sum, then you get something that is divisible by 10. So now here we've got 89, right? And clearly that's not divisible. Um, well, sorry, my apologies. Uh, for the ISBN uh, 10, they didn't actually use the number 10, they used the number 11. Sorry, that's kind of a crucial point there. Um, so the, the goal was to choose a check, check digit that would, um, that would make this number divisible by 11. Now, yeah, we would need another one to be able to say that this is divisible by 11. So basically, we do the division by, um, by 11, we find the reminder, uh, remainder, and then as long as that remainder is not zero, then we find out what do we need to add to be able to make this sum ultimately divisible by 11. So if it's zero, then your check digit would just be zero. But if you got something other than zero, so like here we got 10, then we go and say 11 minus 10, it means I need to add another one. So my check digit here just needs to be one. All right, so ISBN 10 codes, um, they did use the weights, the, all the weights from 10 down to one essentially, and they did division by 11. Now, what happens here, you may, in some older books where they'd still do use the ISBN 10 codes, you might see an X and be a bit confused. Well, remember that here we were using division by 11. And the problem is that we only have 10 digits, right? So we only have from zero to nine. So if we find ourselves in a situation where the remainder after division by 11 is one, then the thing that we need to add to get to change the sum to become divisible by 11 is actually 10. But that's two digits, right? And the whole point here is to add as little information as you can so that uh, you don't um, kind of belabor the amount of information that needs to be stored. And so how do we kind of get around that? Well, what they did is they used a capital X um, because that was the Roman numeral number for 10. But in a sense, to add an additional symbol here, um, that is not ideal. And so since, since the eyes beat in 10, we've kind of adopted a different way. So we can ask a couple of questions. Why did they choose to use 11? And what if we don't want to have this additional symbol of X for 10? Um, because that does complicate mat matters a, ma a bit. And why can't we just go back to that first option that we had where we said division by 10? We still use weights, but we do division by 10. So let's let's have a look and see um, why is it that in uh, 11 worked so well? Well, it worked well because it's what we call a prime number. So a number, a natural number greater than one, so from two onwards, is called a prime number. If it's only two, if it's only positive integer divisors, are um, one and 11. So if you look at two, two is a prime number because it can only be divided by one and two. And that's in fact the only even prime number that we can find. And then from there on, three would be a prime number, five would be a prime number, and 11, this example that we're using here, that's a prime number again. Now, why is that important? Well, it's important because all of these weights that we used from 10 all the way up to, well, two and to one really, they are what we call relatively prime to uh, the, the number 11. So what does that mean? That means if you look at their common divisors, the only thing that they have in common is one. So what does that mean? What do we need to do then when we go and think about using 10? We need to think about using only numbers that are relatively prime to 10. So five is an example of something that's not relatively prime to 10, because obviously five is a divisor of itself and it's a divisor of 10. And what could happen if we use something that's not a divisor? So I'll show both of these. I'm slightly concerned that I'm running out of time. So if we look at these two numbers, notice here that I've got the one for two and I've got the one for six. And now I'm saying, let's suppose for this first position, we have the weight of one, for the second position, we have the weight of three, uh, and then for the uh, last position, we use a weight of five. So if we go and do that, so we take those products and sum them all together, then what we would use as the check digit for both of these 
would be the seven. So if we made that error from two to six, we wouldn't be able to pick that up. And that is basically because um, two times five, four times five, six times five, basically any even numbered multiple of five will get you to a multiple of 10, right? And so then you won't be able to distinguish or it won't provide a different remainder after 10. So then what we get from that is that, yes, we can go and do division by 10 rather, but what we want to do is we want to go and use only weights that are relatively prime to this number that we're doing, um, that we are dividing by. So good candidates would be one, three, seven, and nine. And so in these codes that we see every day, what they do is they make use of weights of one and three, and so they alternate between them. Confusingly, the ISB 13 and the EAN don't do exactly the same in the sense that the one gives uh, the weights of ones to the odd numbers and the weights of threes to the even numbers, and the other one does it the other way around. But let's go and have a look at just one um, European uh, article number where we go and find uh, what should this error uh, check number be. So what happens here is we, so what they say here is they start, don't number, start numbering from the check digit, but from the one just to its left. So that's where you should start. So we're starting to number from the right here. We say that's position one. So then one is in position two, zero is in position three, et cetera. And now what we're going to do is we are going to take all of those digits that are in even positions and we're gonna give them a weight of three. So we multiply each of these with three and all of those digits that are in odd positions. So starting with the six and then the zero and another zero um, and then the seven, et cetera. And for those, we just give a weight of one. And if we then take these, uh, the sum of these, then we get to some number. Again, we do the division by 10 and we say, what would I need to add to the sum so that it would be divisible by 10? So basically you say 10 minus the remainder, that gives me a nine. And that's then why this check digit here is a nine. And this process picks up whenever you make a single digit error. So if there's a one and you accidentally type in a two, it will pick that up. Um, and for the most part, it will pick up when you accidentally swap numbers. So let's say instead of typing in one, two, you type in one minute, one. Dr. Morton. Thank you very much. It will also pick up that, right? Um, but it won't pick up all of them. And that is basically just for the following reason, so that whenever you have numbers that differ, so digits that differ um, with five from each other, um, then what's going to happen there is you're going to just have um, an additional 10 more, right? Because you have that two, time five, two times five that acts in there. Uh, and, and so you won't pick up uh, that, there's a, that there's a difference uh, in the value in that sense. What could be better than knowing something is wrong when something is wrong, right? Lots of things could be better, in particular, something that fixes the problem, right? So initially, when I was asked to give a talk, I wanted to chat to you about uh, not just the check digits, but also the error correcting in QR codes. Um, but for that, I need to, needed to be able to tell you what Galois fields are and all sorts of things, and 10 minutes are just not enough. But what's interesting here is in, in a QR code, something that you're familiar with, that many of you often use, we don't just have a way of showing that something's wrong. There's actually embedded in this, so half the information almost in a QR code is essentially information that helps you retrieve the actual information that you wanted. And that's why I could go and create a QR code like this, where I have our logo in front of a part of the code because embedded in the QR code is enough information to retrieve what was actually supposed to be the data in there. And so if, if, if you are interested in that, um, there is quite a lot of nice mathematics behind uh, the encoding for QR codes. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Dr. Norton. Dr. Morton. I just want to check now. I don't think we have any um, questions for you. Uh, thank you so much for that.
very interesting bar coding mathematics that we had there. Um, before I move on, I think next we have the quiz. Yes, we do have the quiz again uh, with Dr. Craig. So get ready to, um, Dr. Craig, are you ready for the next quiz? Uh, yeah, I'm ready. I'm sharing right. the quiz now. Um, okay. And so we'll just, as before, um, again, this one is a little bit harder. So uh, you're definitely going to want to have a pen and paper ready because um, there are a couple of uh, questions that will require some small calculations. Uh, but once again, it's most, mostly about sort of logic and reasoning, which is really what maths is all about. Um, it's about solving problems. Um, so the, the link is in the, in the chat as well. Uh, I'm just going to wait uh, again, just wait a minute or two um, uh, for people to join. Uh, I, I'd just like to mention as well, I know people are posting some links to various sort of interesting uh, maths uh, topics in the, in the chat. Um, there's a really good YouTube channel called Number File. It does, um, it covers topics quite, quite similar to Dr. Morton's talk now, where it looks at, at mathematics behind sort of everyday concepts. And there's some really brilliant uh, videos. It's all relaxed. It's just people chatting, talking you through it. But you can, you can learn a lot of um, quite deep mathematics from, from the Number File um, YouTube uh, channel. Okay, so the numbers are ticking up here. As I said just now, uh, you want to have a pen and paper ready. I will read out the questions. I know some people were struggling uh, in the last one to see the questions, so I'll read them out. And also, I'm going to put in the chat after this quiz, I'm going to put a PDF, which will have all of the questions, uh, question by question, and then it will have the, the answer as well. So um, you can, if you, if for some reason your network bombed out and you you didn't you didn't get to do the chat online, you can download that PDF and go through the questions one by one uh, and check your answers against the against the answers given there. I think it's a it's a fun thing to do. Um, it's kind of uh, how mathematicians like to spend their weekends solving problems. Um, so I, I hope you'll uh, join us and do the same. Okay, uh, we've got pretty good numbers here, so I'm just going to go on to the uh, next slide. Uh, so this is where you are going to add your um, add your names. Um, yeah, so we've got people coming in. Remember to include the number that represents your grade to make you eligible for prizes. So if I can just ask one of my co-hosts to post the link again in the chat, um, it's ahaslides.com slash UJIDM2. So we're on to quiz two now. And yeah, then just remember that when you, um, uh, when you join, please put a number in your name so that we know what, what grade you represent and definitely have a pen and paper ready. There are gonna be some uh, questions that require a little bit of calculation here. Okay, I'm going to give it one more minute and then we will start. Nice to see lots of people joining. And again, if you if you do happen to miss out, don't worry, the questions will be in the chat afterwards and you can um, go through them on your own or with a friend, uh, maybe challenge some of your uh, friends at school, siblings, um, and you can, you can have a little quiz off um, next week when you see your friends or, or over the weekend. Okay, we are going to start. Good luck, everyone. And let's see who gets the prizes. So the first question asks, what is the minimum number of participants required to attend today's event so that we are certain that at least two participants have their birthday in the same month. And the options are 12, 13, 14, 24, or 365. Cool, okay, so couple of you were Fox there. So we only need 13 uh, people to guarantee that two people have their birthday in the same month. That's called the pigeonhole principle. Question two coming up. The 
it's going to be a hard one to read out. We've got a um, picture. It has in, in the bottom row, there are four boxes, three, four, X, and six. In the second row, there are three boxes, seven, blank, blank. Then two boxes, two blanks, and the top box has 48. And you are asked, you're told that the, uh, the seven is obtained by adding the two numbers directly below it. And the rest of the numbers are obtained in the same way. And it's asking you to solve for the X in the bottom row. Okay, 15 seconds to go. Let's see who can crack this one. Okay, time's up. Let's see. Brilliant. So nine uh, was the correct answer and 15 of you got that. Brilliant, well done. Okay, question three coming up. Question three says, after four games of the World Cup, the women's proteas have scored an average of 223.75 runs per game. So that's after four games, they have scored 223.75 runs, an average of that number of runs per game. The question is, how many runs would they need to score in their fifth game in order to have an average of 230 runs per game after five games. In case you haven't been following, the women's proteas won their first four matches at the World Cup, so it's all looking pretty good for them. So after four games, an average of 223.75. The question is, what do they need to score in their fifth game to average 230? Okay, less than 10 seconds. Okay, brilliant. Another 15 students got it correct. The answer was 255 runs that they needed in their last game. Okay, question four. So we are told that um, x plus 5, sorry, x plus y is equal to 5, and x squared minus y squared is equal to 10. So x plus y is equal to 5, and x squared minus y squared is equal to 10, and you are asked to find the value of x minus y. So a little bit of algebra here. seconds to go. Okay, let's see who got that one. Nice, 32 of you got it correct. The answer there was two. Moving on, question five. So here the question says, we have 2a is equal to 3b, which is also equal to 5c. So 2a equals 3b equals 5c. All the numbers are positive, And then it's asking you to find the relationship between them. Option, uh, the first option is a less than b less than c. The next option is a less than c less than b. C less than B less than A, C less than A less than B, and the last option is B less than C less than A. Let's see who got it. Okay, well done. 
uh, good performance there in, in this question. 48 of you getting it right. And now on to the last question. Question six of six to determine our winner. Let's see who can pull it up out of the bag. Uh, the question says, on a farm, there are some sheep and ducks. Um, in total, there are 40 heads and 124 legs. So there are sheep and ducks. There are 40 heads and 124 legs. And the question is, how many ducks are there? Ten seconds left. Okay, the correct answer there was 18 ducks. So well done to the, um, to the four participants who got that correct. Um, and now let's see who our overall winner is. Brilliant. So well done to Ntokozo Tembu, uh, the winner of this second quiz. Remember that there are prizes in um, each category and there are also spot prizes. So hopefully you're still in line to win a prize and well done again to Tokozo Tembu. Thanks very much. Thank you, Dr. Craig. Well done, um, Tokozo. Um, next up, we have our interviewing a mathematician. So meeting a mathematician and finding out what it is mathematicians do um, and how is it that they just always thinking about maths, 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 maths all the time. All right, so to conduct this interview is Dr. my co-host, Dr. Serene Ratalau. So she will introduce her interviewee. Um, Serene, over to you. Thank you, Dr. Sitole. I'm actually really excited about this segment in the program. And that's because this Meet Mathematician uh, series is being launched today, live on this IDM event. And so this is very special to me because this is a series that has been born out of the Mathematical Structures Research Group at NITEX. And so today I am very humbled to be able to be on this platform and interview a mathematician. And so more importantly, I'm happy that it's actually live. So today I'm going to be interviewing Professor of Mathematics, Professor Zura Bjanalitsa from Stellenbosch University. I'll just tell you very briefly a bit more about his research interests. His research interest lies within the field of categorical algebra, but more generally or widely category theory, topology, algebra, and logic. He serves on the editorial board of three, of, uh, of two, sorry, for two of the three main international journals in category theory, and is the current president of the South African Mathematical Society. So welcome, Prof. Yonalitza. I'm so glad that I'm able to interview you today. Thank you very much, Serene. Um, or should I say Dr. Ratilal, because you're actually also a mathematician, right? <laughs> yes, indeed. Um, is my background um, visible correctly? Um, it is indeed, you? yes, absolutely perfect. And I thought I'll join in and match you too. So thank you once again, as I said, for joining. And I think what we, I'd like to do is actually ask the burning question. And that is, what influenced you to become a mathematician? So the burning question is, why did you become a mathematician? The creative process. I, I enjoy um, creating something out of almost nothing. Um, but the process itself is, is what is very enjoyable. And that kind of enjoyment, I couldn't find in any other um, area. The, the one that I found in, in creating mathematics. So where did your love for mathematics actually begin? Um, I think, um, well, my father is a mathematician, so I've been exposed to mathematics a lot. And I learned a lot of mathematics from him from early age on. But then the point where uh, the, the passion was really sparked was uh, when I was working on a project at the end of school, I had to um, take a part in a, in a research type of competition throughout the country. I'm, I'm from Georgia. 
and um, uh, a research pro project I worked on there. Um, uh, I constructed something which later turned out to be an n-dimensional vector space over a two-element field. Uh, and that was the process which took uh, several weeks uh, and it was so uh, so deep and, and so enjoyable that um, I, I knew from that time on that I that's what I want to do for the rest of my life. I think that's absolutely beautiful. Can you share with the students what it is that you do as a mathematician um, every day? So what does your tasks uh, on a given day involve? Well, uh, we all uh, we are all forced to do things we don't particularly love in everyday life. Uh, but when I do have opportunity to to do what I really want to do, then uh, that's doing mathematics. And so doing mathematics is a bit different from, um, for example, what we do at school or even competitions when you have the time limit. Uh, real mathematics begins when you basically um, forget about time. You don't keep track of time anymore. And you are focused on, on trying to understand a certain phenomenon. Um, and then uh, you work for hours and hours, but these hours run without you noticing them because you're so much involved and, and so so much love what you're doing. So that's th that's the task that I would describe would be for for my perfect day when I have time to to do mathematics all day and maybe sometimes even going tonight. Um, um, yeah, I would. Um, I would describe that as the um, uh, the day when when I want the day to be the way I, I want it to be. But other times we, we do other things as well, of course, as, as everybody else. Can you share with us um, perhaps something about one of your mathematical areas of interest, something that makes you happy on your perfect day? What it is? Sorry, what would it be that you would spend time researching? Um, the area of category theory, um, it's a branch of mathematics where we, it, it, it's sort of like mathematics of mathematics. You, you try to understand uh, different phenomenon in different areas of mathematics, but then you also want to connect these phenomena with similar phenomenon in other areas of mathematics. Um, so um, looking at uh, some some specific mathematical situation, and then you notice some kind of pattern or maybe some kind of uh, something sparks your emotion, some specific aspect of, of that situation. And then you, you go after it and you, you try to explore where it leads to. And then it, it's, li it's, it's like uh, hiking uh, where you hike for a long time. And then at some point there is this beautiful view in front of you on the top of the hill that opens up. Um, I think I forgot your, what the question was. I just wanted to know a little bit more about what would you be spending time researching on your purpose? Yes, so, so yeah. that kind of thing where I, I, take a, I take a phenomenon from a specific um, uh, topic in mathematics and I try to understand uh, the, the deeper insight behind it. And, and then the tools of category theory provide you uh, means for, for engaging at, at a deeper level. And then uh, after that, you, you discover connections with other topics as well that previously you, you couldn't have predicted that such connections would arise. Um, I cannot be more specific because then we would have to study a lot of mathematics um, to be more specific. No, indeed, but it's definitely given us some insight into your process of conducting mathematical research, and I think that's very important. My next question is about the, the journey to becoming a mathematician. So how did you become a mathematician? What is the educational background that one would require? I think uh, much more important than educational background is passion, because so we all know that, uh, well, everything requires hard work, right? And including mathematics, but you can't really do hard work if you don't love the thing. So if you don't have strong passion for, for the subject, uh, you will you end up minimizing the time you spend with it. 
Uh, and if you only spend the time that you're forced to, perhaps by, by the school or the university, you will actually not get there. So much more important than education is passion. And education is just like a framework which allows you to express that passion. But sometimes education even could stop you. For example, at school, I must say that I didn't like mathematics at school. In fact, um, I, I was doubting that I would actually uh, be interested to do mathematics because school mathematics for me was very restrictive and, and very limiting in terms of uh, creativity. So, but, but then when I worked on that project that I talked about, that, that, that I saw what, what really mathematics is about, that's, that, that's when I decided, okay, so education at school doesn't define what mathematics is. And I have to find my own mathematics and each mathematician actually finds their own mathematics. And that journey of finding math your own mathematics in the framework, in the education framework where you are, is I think much more important than education itself. But otherwise the, the usual education is of course you do undergraduate studies and then you do postgraduate studies, you do PhD. And, and hopefully after that, you're able to do, to do your own mathematics. Absolutely, thank you for sharing that. And I think it's very important what you mentioned. It's about curiosity and finding out and investigating things for yourself as well. Um, so seeing that you've gone through this journey on your own, um, what else would you recommend an aspiring mathematician uh, to perhaps do in order to make their journey a little bit easier? Um, in becoming a mathematician. So is there any advice? Um, when you ask easier, easier in what sense? Because it's not easy. Oh, certainly it, it, not. It, uh, it, it's actually the other way around. It's, it's very difficult, but then you, you, you start to enjoy that difficulty. So the difficulty for you is no longer a difficulty, but it's actually something that sparks your, your passion and, and your interest. But then there is also another kind of difficulty, like having a bursary and having a good teacher and, and, and so on, these kind of difficulties. And so for that kind of difficulties, what is important is to search, especially to search for uh, other people who share similar passion as you. So for example, uh, it could be your teacher, it could be your school teacher, it could be your friend, it could be someone else. Searching like-minded people, I think is extremely important, not only at the beginning, but also later on when you're entering into career, you want to be collaborating with other mathematicians who have similar mathematical interests. Um, so that makes life easier when you, when you have found such people, but, uh, but you don't expect that these people will solve your mathematical problems. So you, 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 at the same time, you want to enjoy uh, uh, solving mathematical problems. And so problem for you shouldn't be a problem anymore. It should be something that excites you. Exactly, we should be excited by a challenge of being presented with a new problem that will help us discover or learn new things about the unknown. Yes, but of course, should be is a bad word here. I mean, not everybody will be excited by mathematics. Some will be excited by art, by music, other sciences. So we shouldn't, I don't think we should kind of prescribe this as, uh, as a rule, but I do believe that it's possible to find enjoyment in mathematics, even when your main passion is in something else. Agreed. Thank you for those sentiments and also for correcting my choice of words. Um, so before we end, do you have any final words that you would like to, to share with students who wishes, who would like to pursue a career or the study of mathematics? Um, I think I would, I would revert back to putting love at, at the first place and to be uh, kind of protective of, of what your heart tells you. Because very often you might be in a situation where the environment might be telling you something that goes against your heart. And the important thing there is to persevere. And um, by searching for like-minded people, then you, you they will then support you to persevere further. So don't abandon the idea that love should be, mathematics should be enjoyable. If it is not, it doesn't mean necessarily that something is wrong with your understanding of mathematics. It might be that something is wrong in the system in, in which you are in, interacting. 
uh, and and not be don't be afraid to uh, to propose to change the system. I think mathematics is all about discovering new things and making changes. Um, I mean, new things are discovered by by the desire to make some change, right? Um, and, and so, um, fighting for what you believe in. Uh, yeah, that's the kind of attitude you want to have in, in order to succeed in mathematics. Thank you, Prof. Jana Litzer, for those closing sentiments on love and perseverance in the pursuit of mathematics. So thank you very as much. We, thank you. And so as we wrap up this session on Meet a Mathematician, I would also like to announce that um, this interview will be available on the Meetex YouTube channel as well as an interview with Professor Loiso Nongta, um, who I had the privilege of interviewing a few days ago. So his Meet a Mathem Mathematician interview will be available on the YouTube channel of Netex on Tuesday morning. So we look forward to engaging with you online and I hope that we inspire a future generation of mathematicians through all of these initiatives that we will be running. So stay tuned on the, new on the YouTube Netex channel for further initiatives. And so that brings us to the end of the Meet, Meet a Mathematician segment. And I thank Professor Zura Bianoletza once again. Thank you. Bye. So as we move on in the program, I think we've now reached a point that all of you have been eagerly awaiting. And that is the announcement of the winners of the photo challenge, as well as the quiz winners from the other categories. So to introduce and announce the winners of the photo challenge, I would like to introduce you to the president of the Northcliffe Rotary Club, uh, Robert Jacobs. So Robbie is uh, a lover of mathemat mathematics since at least 2001. He is a civil engineer by training and he currently works in corporate risk management and is a person whose love for maths has guided his career path and also enabled his progress both within the working environment and outside, outside of it. I now hand over to the president of the Northcliffe Rotary Club, Robert Jacobs. Over to you. Great, thank you so much, Serene, and thank you to all of the attendees for this um, wonderful International Day of Mathematics celebration. Um, you know, I'm not a mathematician, but I can certainly see that there are going to be quite a number joining the ranks of Dr. Atilal, Dr. Zurab, and all of the other speakers that have been here today. So, you know, maybe you're asking what has Rotary got to do with mathematics? Rotary has focus areas of education and literacy and economic and community development. And thankfully, you know, some of my work has really been done for me today by the previous speakers explaining how vitally important maths is and the other sciences are in community development, specifically the, the stats essay. I mean, that was really fascinating. And I think that I am definitely with some of the learners today who, yeah, we had a little bit more difficulty in um, Dr. Craig's quiz. So that was, but that was, that was a lot of fun. Before I get on to the, the prize winners, which I, you know, I'm sure you're really excited about, I want to say that, you know, how do you get involved? Just the same as you get involved with your school, with your community, you can get involved with supporting your community through joining your local Rotaract or Interact clubs. That goes right down to, to high school and university level. So if you are interested, please look on our website, which is northcliffrotary.co.za, and there are a lot of resources that you can get through that. Right, on to the thing that we've all been waiting for. Right, the photo challenge winners. Um, what this really shows to me is that there's people who have been engaging right from the very first, um, you know, the first notification about the, about the um, International Day of Mathematics. And so here we are to celebrate them. There are spot or there are prizes for the runners up, which is UJ merchandise, which is very exciting, especially if you're not quite at UJ yet, it's really exciting. And there are prizes for the winners, which is take a lot vouchers. And as you know, I'm sure by now, take a lot, you can pretty much get, you know, 
anything online today. So let's go. The first is the grade eight and nine category. And the runner up is Dokoza Nkuna from Kanisa Education Center. Congratulations, Dokoza. And the winner for the grade eight and nine category is the Boys and Girls Club of SA Mareburn. So well done to all the people in grade eight and nine who've entered this competition. Next up, we have the grade 10 to grade 12 category. So this is the guys who are really thinking about, you know, what's coming next for their, for their lives. And the runner up is Msizi Makatini. And the winner is Gayabu Lukusa. Well done to all of the winners from the grade 10 to 12 category. Finally, we have the undergraduate category. And, you know, this is when things are really getting tough. Things are, you know, you're really spending a lot of time working and studying. So congratulations for being part of this. And the runner up in this undergraduate category is Norma Sande Njobe from NWU Val campus. And the winner of the undergraduate category, and I'm glad to see that this person has been engaging with us today is Tensualo and Lovu from UJ. So congrats to all of the winners. You can get your prizes by sending the details to the following email address, and I'll post it in the chat in a moment, cratilal at uj.ac.za. So you can send your full name and surname, your contact number, and your delivery address or email address. So all of those winners, congratulations. Um, Northcliffe Rotary is proud to be part of such a, an initiative by the UJ, and we thank you for spending your time here on the Saturday morning, when I'm sure a lot of you will be very happy to be outside relaxing in the sun. Thank you very much, and back to you, Suri. Thank you, Mr. Jacobs. Um, thank you so much. Yes, that's very true. I think a lot of them um, would be happier going to bed since they had to wake up so early to be part of this event. So we thank them for that. Now to announce our quiz winners um, and the prizes is Dr. Sonwabile Mafunda. So Dr. Sonwabile is also a mathematician. Um, currently teaching mathematics at the University of Johannesburg, and his interest is in graph theory. Uh, Dr. Mafuna, over to you. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Dr. Stelle. Okay, uh, I hope I'm audible. Can you guys all hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you. Uh, without wasting time, I think this is a moment that we've all been waiting for. So the winners for the, for the first for the first quiz, or for grade nine and 11, we had James. And from grade 10 to grade 12, we had Shriash. And from, uh, for the universities, uh, which is the undergrad university student, we, we had Shiva. Okay, congratulations to all of you guys. And at the end of this presentation, I will show an email address that you'll have to email to, uh, to obtain your prizes. Okay, for the second, uh, Oh, for the sport prizes in quiz one, we've got the following people. From grade eight, we've got Ma Madia Hussein, and for grade from grade 11, we had Katleho, and for the undergraduate, we've had Rachel Mufuke. Congratulations once again to all of you guys. And for quiz number two, we had the following people. That's grade nine and grade 11 winner was Harrison, with 277 points. And for grade 10, we, go, we had Connie with 377 points. And for the university category, we had Ndogo Zomtembo with 460 points. And well done to you guys. For the sport prizes, we've got Madia from grade 11 again. We've got K from grade 12 and Tembelife for, um, for the university category. Well done to all of you guys and well done to everyone who has participated. Thank you so much to Dr. Craig uh, for running this uh, quiz, to, um, uh, to Dr. Robinson for creating the quiz uh, and the details that you would need to email to claim your prizes are shown in the screen. But I'm sure Dr. Radila is going to talk more about that. Thank you for joining and well done to everyone who participated in the quiz.
Thank you, Dr. Mafunda, for that. I'm sure everyone's excited uh, to have found out who has won. So please note that if you are a winner of quiz one, then your prize is actually a wireless charger and a 8,000 milliampere power bank. And if you are the winners of quiz two, then your prize is actually wireless Bluetooth ear, uh, AirPods and a pen gift set. All of these items are UJ branded. So please don't forget to send an email to siratilal at uj.ac.za with the relevant information, including the delivery address and a contact number so that we could get your prizes to you. As we now close the program, I would now like to introduce you to Professor Moronga. Professor Moronga is a Dean of Science at the Nelson Mandela Metropolitan University. He was previously a professor of physics and the director of the UJ Soweto Science Center at UJ. Um, he completed a Bachelor of Science in Physics at the University of Venda, a Master of Science at the University of Cape Town, and a PhD in Physics at the University of Minnesota. I would now like to hand over to Prof Moranga, who will be officially closing our program on behalf of NETEX. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Ratila. Um, uh, let me say greetings to all our wonderful participants, uh, the students, the learners from schools, our panelists, and our distinguished guests. Let me first say greetings from the National Institute of uh, Theoretical and Computational Sciences. Uh, thanks to our program directors and hosts, uh, Dr. Ratilal and Dr. Sitole. And uh, I want to also thank uh, Professor Farai uh, Nareza, who actually welcomed us and we felt at home. And to our panelists who gave us great messages from uh, Professor Steen Jordan, who connected the mathematics in school and uh, how it can be used to solve the problems. Uh, Prof. Ibrahim Monyonyat, who actually came and tell us that math can be used in various things from quantifying and interpreting data to finance data in many other areas. I think we have learned a lot from that. And thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Andrew Craig, thanks for facilitating the thesis. That's why we have uh, the, the winners. You, you did very well. And it keeps us as the participants awake all the time. Uh, and, and I want to also congratulate all the winners of all our thesis today. And, uh, and my Mr. Faisal Mohammed, that's SA. You have demonstrated that without numbers, uh, we will not make sense of the world around us. So thank you very much for presenting the numbers. And it, it, it calls on us to use the numbers, especially the scientists and the mathematicians, whenever we make an argument. We should use the numbers all the time. We have seen that through, during the COVID-19, that without the numbers, we will not know how risky and how dangerous uh, the COVID-19 was. And Dr. Mamueli Tsimosia from NRF, he, she showed us that uh, role modeling is very important. So to the participants, look out at your role model and follow those role models in, 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 in mathematics. We appreciate the role played by SASTA and NRI. Uh, Dr. Momo John, so thank you very much. Uh, now we understand when we go to, to the shops and we are scanning through the, 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 the barcodes, through the scanners, we, we, we will realize and recognize uh, your uh, participation here today. Uh, the interview by Dr. Um, by, by Dr. Ratulal uh, with the Prof. Rab Genelese. Thank you very much, Prof. Janelize. I think I think that's that's exactly what we need to convey: uh, 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 the, the the love of what you want to do, the passion that you need to have in order to do mathematics. I think that's very important because if we do not do that, if we do not speak about the challenges and the processes, then we will be misleading our youth. We need to tell them about the rewards, the spin-offs the challenges, the difficulties. Uh, I'm glad you touched on the difficulties of, of finding the scholarships, but you also provided the solution. How should you go about searching for the solutions, looking for people with a similar 
uh, research interest. That's very important. NRC president, uh, thank you very much for introducing the Rotary Club to, to, to us. And thank you for sponsoring and for announcing the winners and well done to grade 10 to 11 category as well as the undergraduate category. You did us proud and we think that there will be more sponsorships when uh, this event, the IDM comes again 2022 and beyond, 2023 and beyond. We are hoping that many people will come and sponsor and we hope that students and learners who are here will go back and say, look, this is going to happen each and every year. Please come on board. And uh, to Dr. Sonorile for announcing the winners once again, well done to all the winners in first prizes and sport prizes for all categories of eight and nine, the 10 to 12, as well as university category. We are saying halala to you. Well done, you beat UJ proud today. And I want to say to the partners of IBM 2022, NIFEX, NRF SASTA, SAMS, SAMS, and NRC, please don't forget to partner with uh, this event again in the future. Thank you very much and well done. And to this day, I'm saying uh, IDM 2022 was a success and we will meet you next time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Prof Moranga. We officially close the program. Thank you all for joining. Stay safe and keep well. The University of Johannesburg, the future reimagined.